this morning to our service, for those of you that are here physically, and also for those that are watching on YouTube. And we do pray that God will really bless our coming together today. We will commence our service with our opening hymn, which is one that we sing quite often here, and I trust is the prayer of our hearts, near my God today, near today. And let's stand to sing.
And we thank you this morning, Lord, even as so often we say, where can we go but to the Lord? And surely in these troublesome days we lift our eyes again unto the hills from where comes our help. Our help cometh from the Lord, the one who is the maker of heaven and earth. I pray, dear Father, that you will meet with us again on this Lord's Day morning, that you will reveal yourself to us, that thou art the all-sufficient one. We ask you, dear Father, that you will remember those in the congregation who are not able to be with us today. Pray for those that are isolating. Pray for those that are fearful, Father. I pray for those with special need this morning and for those that are in hospital, that they might know your touch and your mighty hand resting upon them. Thank you this morning that you fearfully and wonderfully made us. We thank you to be made in the image of God. And I just pray, Father, that you will remember your word as it goes forth here today. We look to you for the anointing of the Spirit of God, that your word will be a word in season for each one of us. And do remember, Father, even the crisis that this world is in, and men's hearts are filling them for fear. And Father, we thank you that you are still in control, that God is still on the throne. I pray, Father, that you remember those that are working in difficult circumstances, especially we pray for those that work in the health service, that you'll give to them strength and daily grace. Even those, Father, connected with the congregation here, the daily Lord, that they might know that help that cometh from the Lord. Remember doctors, consultants, psychiatrists, and so many others that are seeking to help people. And we thank you for the gifts that you've given to many. And I just pray that in these difficult days, Lord, that you will move and work and fulfill your plans and purposes. Remember to those, Father, who have lost loved ones over this week, I just pray that you will bless all that born, realizing that there is a time to be born, you tell us, and that there is a time to die. And so I pray that you might teach us to number our days, that we might supply our hearts unto wisdom. Thank you for making it possible for each one to be here. Thank you, Lord, for those who attend so faithfully the house of God. Thank you for those that help out in so many different ways and so often even behind the scenes. I just pray that each one, Lord, might encourage themselves these days in the things of God. And so we look to you and we thank you that yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I heard a hymn being played in our house the other day, and I was asking all of what it was. I couldn't remember the beginning of it, and we're going to have it now. And so we might have had it, but in these dark days, it's good to look up. It was a very dark day whenever Calvary uh, was happening, whenever the Lord Jesus was suffering the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And so we're going to sing this lovely hymn, just remaining seated.
mentioned earlier, we're glad to have you all in the Lord's house this morning. And we do pray that God will really bless our coming together. There are a few uh, maybe extra uh, points that I want to mention today. Um, first of all, I want to thank our new recruit here, another of our new recruits in the PowerPoint, Ryan. And I'm uh, so glad that there's been a number that have made themselves available. All these things are so important, so important to have an organist. I, we're having the recording, student records, and of course, I, so many of you do so much behind the scenes, and I know that you do it as unto the Lord. We are commencing on Sunday, the 8th of November, that's next Sunday, that there will be the service that will be going on YouTube. Now, it will be always one week behind and I realise that there's been a number of the congregation that are isolating. There's also a number that are still fearful about returning. And I've had quite a positive response this week I, um, from a number of folk. But it's always nice to get a response because even during lockdown, we delivered the CDs around the doors and that. And generally speaking, you don't get a good response. But I, it's been nice to get a response to this. And I know that not all will be uh, connected to the internet, and so Stuart's going to make available CDs. And so if someone is isolating, uh, it means that you'll have the service. Now, uh, we're going to put the CDs to those that um, are using them. I, I did actually ask a few people where I was delivering CDs before. I had heard this before, that I, um, in the past, whenever there used to be tapes going about, that very often people get the, uh, these things, but whether or not they actually listen to them is another thing. And I did say to some, I said, well, how did you find the CDs that I delivered to you? And some of them said, well, you know, it wasn't in great form to listen to anything. <laughs> well, I suppose I would have appreciated maybe then that they weren't wasted. But we want to get the CDs to those that are going to, of course, uh, use them. I know that many of you are on this WhatsApp group now. I don't pass it on to me because I know nothing to grow better than that. If you want connected or you know someone that does, I contact Timothy or else I, my wife. And I, then there's a few other I, announcements. And I, one is that from now on, on a Sunday morning service, whenever there's people in hospital, because this is going on to YouTube, I'm not mentioning any names uh, during prayer. So I don't want you to think that I don't care if uh, you have a relative in hospital or that and I don't pray for them, but that's the reason. I do pray for them, but I'll not do it publicly whenever it's been uh, recorded. Also, uh, with regard to the building, uh, this wall should soon be down. And that means actually, if you want to isolate, if you want two metres apart, three metres apart, I'm sure we need to stretch four metres apart, we'll be able to do that. And I'm uh, sorry the back door's locked today because the work is going on at the side of the church here this week. And uh, so it's the front door we're going to use. So again, at the back row is leave for, uh, first and uh, so on. Now, uh, the other general announcements are the evening service at 7 p.m. for a meeting on Thursday at 8 p.m., Life Lenders 6.30. And then on Saturday, uh, Samuel sent me an email asking me to announce the Haven over in Dungannon. The speaker will be Pastor Scott McFarlane. It's lovely to hear that there was 55 or 56 at the Haven last month. And so I hope that some of you young folk that are driving in that night are able to get over. Or if you need a lift, we'll contact us and we'll make sure that you get there. Scott will be speaking on the subject very relevant to today of um, anxiety and the Condi girls will be singing. So I was reading yesterday where the ambulance service these days are attending 37 suicides or attempted suicides in London every day. So there's a lot of anxiety out there. So it's a very relevant uh, subject. Those are, I think, uh, all the announcements. And if I've forgotten anything, well, you just come to me or send me an email or text of, and I will try to do our best. As I've said back whenever we opened up the church, we've never passed this way before. I'm sure I'll not get it right. I've said that, 
and I'm sure that we don't always meet everyone's expectations, but we will try to do our best. I know sometimes your best is not enough, but I, um, we will try to do our best to accommodate folk. Those are our announcements. We're going to sing before we turn to the story of Nehemiah. And it is lovely to have so many upstairs to you uh, this morning. And again, make sure you're comfortable. If you're more comfortable sitting in the hallway, you sit there. If you're more comfortable sitting amongst all that cleaning stuff in the old kitchen, you know, I don't think that you're an oddball because you sit in there amongst all that, uh, that stuff. Not for a moment. If you're comfortable sitting in there, there's an open window, you can look right out. But just make sure you're comfortable. That's the main thing. So we're going to sing this chorus before we read the scriptures. your Bible with you, we're going to turn to Nehemiah and chapter 6, Nehemiah and chapter 6. And for those that may be listening on YouTube, we are going through the series in Nehemiah. I Hopefully you'll be able to follow the first sermons which started before lockdown I, they should be, if they're not on already, I'm not too sure, but they should be on the church website uh, in the t- near future if they're not on yet. So if you follow those, maybe then you'll know exactly where we're going in this story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah in chapter 6 and verse 1. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershon the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. That Sinbalad and Gershon sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? whilst I leave it and come down to you. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. 
wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. For thou hast also appointed prophets to preach at thee, of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king, according to these words, Come now therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that had been not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delilah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sinbalad had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sinbalad according to these their works, and on the prophetess Nodiah, and on the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month, Elu, in fifty and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shemaniah, the son of Ra'ara, the son of Johanan, and taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berkiah. Also they reported his good deeds before me, and uttered my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. And may God bless his word again uh, to our hearts and to our needs this morning. I realize that whenever we're reading through the story of Nehemiah, that perhaps it's a good thing to read it even prior to the service, to read it a number of times, just to get the true meaning of the passage. God willing, we'll be going into chapter 7, a very complicated chapter, uh, a chapter with lots and lots of names in it, uh, a chapter that is much more difficult perhaps to follow. But we leave that for next Lord's Day, if God spares and tarries. Where we have left off last week, we have said that, or the previous week, because last Sunday was our harvest services, we have said that some people think that the Bible is outdated, that it's irrelevant to this generation. But we have looked as to how in chapter 5 that Nehemiah's prophecy here and his story covers the aspect of overpopulation. And so overpopulation is nothing new. It was around in Nehemiah's day. It also covers the aspect of famine. It covers high interest rates. You remember as to how the people had mortgaged their lands and they sold their children into slavery because they needed the money in a time of crisis to pay the king's taxes. And so we've looked at a people that were in great uh, distress. We also covered the aspect that the amazing thing was that those who uh, took advantage of the poorer Jews uh, mostly were the richer Jews themselves. And we said that it is an amazing thing that even Christians experience that sometimes, where another Christian may be out to gain advantage over them. 
We've also looked at the aspect of loaning money and uh, we covered in our last message as to when that could be loaned and when interest could be charged on that money that was loaned. We also said that Nehemiah in chapter 5 and verse 6, whenever he heard all these things, he was very, very angry. He was enraged. And he tells us in verse 7 of chapter 5 that he consulted with himself. And there are times whenever we'll sit down and we'll think a thing over ourselves and we'll think a thing over or through, uh, through ourselves. We know the Bible tells us there lacketh not wisdom and a multitude of counsellors. And it's good to get counsel at times, but there are times whenever we have to think something through for ourselves. And then lastly, before I go into the message today, we did cover the aspect as to how leadership was going to cost him. And anyone that is in the work of God, or anyone that goes into the work of God, imagining that everything will be rosy, that everything will be nice, they're in for a rude awakening. You've only to read the book of Acts and see the problems in the early church whenever the murmuring started, that there were the widows that were being neglected. And so it's nothing new. We said about the leaders that the emotional and spiritual stress of leadership can become unbearable uh, upon a leader that is under pressure. Now there are times whenever pressure is good for us. We need to know and be aware of our coping mechanisms as to how much we can cope with and when we need to take a step back and when we need to have, as we've said before, a me day where you put yourself first and you forget about uh, what's going on around you. Some leaders break under pressure. And that's happening today. We realize that, that many in the Lord's work are finding it extremely difficult to cope with this COVID crisis. And I get a Christian email that usually comes through daily, and there are many, many pastors and Christian workers that are leaving the work of God. They just cannot cope any longer because COVID has brought new pressures, those who feel things should be done this way, those that feel things should be done another way, and so on. And so uh, you try to steer as clear a road as you can, but you cannot always succeed with that. Others become discouraged, they quit. Some build walls around themselves to insulate their hearts. And we also said that some become embattled, some become very embittered and vindictive and further isolated, resulting in failure. Many of you remember I told a story many years ago of the time that we lived in the Black Hill, which is over 30 years ago now, where I got a phone call from someone that was selling life insurance. And I... I remember saying to them, look here, I don't want to waste your time. And there's no point in me wasting my time. But I do not have the money. The work was only starting here to pay life, life insurance. And then I said, well, by the way, I'm saved. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have life insurance. I'm not saying that. It's probably irresponsible maybe not to have, especially if you have a young family or that. But that's an individual choice. But at that particular time, this man, he said to me, well, this is rather interesting. You tell me that you're a Christian. I appreciate the fact that you don't want to waste my time, but I would like to come to talk to you. And I, I said, you're very, very welcome to come to Seven Riverside Drive. And he came to me and he talked. And he said to me, he said, I was a minister. And I, I was in the ministry for a number of years. And I, he asked me, he said, would you like some books? And I said, well, I, I'd appreciate that. And he left me quite a quantity of books. And I talked with him. I discovered he had maybe difficult experiences in the ministry, but he became disillusioned. I remember thinking, this is sad. But it happens. And so I, um, others sometimes maybe benefit from experience and become more effective leaders under stress. Nehemiah was a good leader. 
because he got them all together to listen to their complaints. He tried to steer a way through it. He tried to do his best. And uh, he had to uh, consult with the people and then we're told that there was a measured, and I say this, a measured repentance that took a place. That brings me into my subject for today. And I can assure you, I like to be a man of my word, and you'll be out in the hour. I, I can assure you of that. Uh, because we do appreciate the fact that you're, you, you've gathered with us today. My subject for this morning is dealing with distractions in the work of God. You see, one of the great examples of a man who lived a life of vision and had to deal with distractions over two and a half thousand years ago was this man, Nehemiah. We've been looking at a story now for quite a long time, on and off because of lockdown. Now, chapter 5, I've covered it again, just to refresh our memories. It was about a people in real distress. There are many issues we must wrestle with in life. And maybe you find yourself this morning and you're wrestling with issues. And you only wish they'd go away. And you only wish you could bury your head in the sand. And maybe sometimes you seek to avoid those issues rather than maybe having to address them. I'm going to quote UCB notes that I read this week that I know a lot of you use. And I make no apology for the fact, I may not always stroke all my T's, but I do be greatly blessed through the UCB notes. On the 27th this week, the UCB notes were about learning from Moses. And you will have read this here because I jotted it down because we can forget a lot of things. But in the notes it said this here, you must persevere when life is difficult. Now, is life difficult? Of course it is. It's extremely difficult. It's difficult for everybody. Difficult for children. Difficult for society. I, I listen to the London City News there. I get it on the radio. I listen to it quite often, actually, uh, what's going on in the mainland. And the other night, when I was listening to the news, or the other evening, I just said this, that London is a ghost city. People's not there. Too afraid. Things have greatly changed. And so UCB notes said, or you must persevere when life gets difficult. It's a fact of life. There's no gain without pain. Have you read that? Well, you will have read it if you use the notes. There's no advancement without adversity. And there's no progress without problems. All those things can help us develop in our Christian experiences. Because on and says this here, Moses understood that difficulties come into every life and he knew how to respond to them correctly and move on. And you know, I love that little phrase there, and move on. There are times in life whenever we've got to move on. You know, if I, you're maybe facing some issue today, you will maybe hopefully reach the place where you'll address that issue, but don't get stuck there. Move on. It's very, very important to keep moving. And then I'll conclude the UCB notes for this year. I said these words, you must know who you are. And it's wonderful this morning we're made in the image of God. We're all individuals. We all have different ways of doing things and saying things. We have all different personalities. You must know who you are. The second thing is you must take responsibility for your life. And I have addressed that back in whenever the church opened up again as to how we must take responsibility for the choices that we make in life. We can blame our parents, we can blame society, we can blame everything, but we have to take responsibility ourselves. The third thing was, determine your priorities. What's our priorities? On the 1st of November, 2020, what's our priorities? And the fourth one was, persevere when life gets difficult. If you abide by these four Bible truths, you will live a life that is truly blessed by God. And I'm sure that's the desire 
of every child of God here this morning to live a life that is truly blessed by God. If you look at anyone who has been used by God to make a difference in the world, that person has lived a life of purpose. It has been said that life is like a coin. And the way we're pushing towards a cashless society, coins will soon be a thing of the past, obviously. But it has been said that life is like a coin. Uh, We get to spend it any way we like, but we only get to spend it once. When it's spent, it's spent. Isn't that so true? Life is like a coin. We get to spend it any way we like, but we only get to spend it once. The real tragedy is that people get distracted, even in the work of God, and visions are lost. In Nehemiah's goal for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, Nehemiah had to stand up to the violent threats of the enemy in chapter 4. He had to deal with the internal conflict in chapter 5. He is the wall almost complete, except we're told here in chapter 6, except for the gates, or the doors upon the gates, in verse 1. So it's almost complete. But the enemy doesn't give up. The enemy doesn't go to sleep. Back in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, we were introduced to some characters. One was called Sinbalad, a leader in Samaria, and Gershon, the leader of his Arab tribe. There's also a man called Tobiah who was an official of Ammon. They had jeered at Nehemiah. They had laughed at the work that Nehemiah was doing in building these walls. They said if a fox goes up, a fox will knock the whole thing down. It's so feeble. They mocked it. Now they've moved from jeering to actively opposing and planning to fight against Nehemiah. Now, life is full of distractions. I don't know about you, but I keep a tick list. I use recycled paper. I'm very bad at disposing of things. I like to, and I think a lot of it is your upbringing. And a lot of it, I think, stems back from the fact that I worked for a man whenever I was 13, and you reused envelopes and you reused if there were bits of paper you reused it and if there was string you unravelled that string whenever parcels came back and you tied it onto the ball again and it was reused and I think some of that stays with you sometimes so I recycle wee bits of paper and I jot down what all I need to do that day or some of the things and even for tomorrow God willing I've jotted down some of the things that I have to do, uh, things that I have to post. I keep a record for those that get gazettes and CDs and all the rest of it, uh, because sometimes you have to set goals. But it's so easy in life to get distracted. Maybe you get distracted by the news. Maybe you get distracted by you hear a bit of a buzz in your mobile phone and see, you know, somebody's trying to get through, there's a text message coming through, and so you get distracted. You're in the middle of something and all of a sudden you're distracted. Maybe the phone rings or maybe a child falls or hurts themselves and all the time we're being distracted, all the time. Maybe you get down to pray and you hear letters coming through the door and you get distracted. And you wonder what they're about. Maybe the phone rings or maybe there's something else. And I think sometimes our, my greatest distraction anyway is our dog. You get down to pray and Susie wants out and then she wants in and you get down to pray again and she wants out again. And, you know, I, I've, I've joked and I've said this dog's going to outlive us all and that nobody else seems to, to want the dog. I, um, in the Times yesterday, there was an article in the Times yesterday as to how dogs are being stolen. Uh, they're so expensive, God. So I got all of to I uh, photograph this and send it off to our boys. I uh, just need to look after these dogs because Jonathan is a cocker spaniel over in England now, and I see they're very popular. For I've been a target for 
for thieves. But all of she laughed yesterday because she said that she got a tax message back. With all these dogs being stolen, maybe we should put a ribbon around Susie and set her on the doorstep and see what response will happen. But we're getting distracted all the time. Now, distractions are not always bad. Some distractions are good. But they are distractions nonetheless. And so the enemy is hard at work keeping people busy here, keeping them occupied. Maybe you're in our meeting this morning and you're not saved yet. In these the closing days of time and you have no hope if Jesus Christ comes back today, you'll be left behind to await the wrath and the judgment of God. But you're distracted. And there's many things to distract us from getting saved these days. You need to seriously consider it, friend. Because what a tragedy to be left behind when Jesus returns. That's why we're, we would encourage you, whenever we're saved, to keep our focus on the Saviour. Oh, we've covered the enemy's ridicule in Nehemiah. We've covered the halfway hurdle in chapter 4. We've covered the internal strife in chapter 5. But chapter 6 is dealing much with distractions in serving God. We haven't heard from Nehemiah for a whole chapter, but now they're back, uh, from his enemies rather, for a whole chapter, but now his enemies are back. They were there at the beginning of the work, they were there in the middle of the work, and now they're here again at the end of the work. What does that teach me? The devil never gives up on the child of God. Don't ever think there's a day comes in any of our lives where we can say, Goodbye, devil. You're not going to torment me anymore or trouble me anymore. No. You remember, he even came to the Lord Jesus through Peter. Why isn't coming through Peter? And Jesus looks at Peter and Jesus says to Peter, Get you behind me, Satan. You're not savoring the things that be of God, but of men. You see, we've seen the enemy attacking externally through ridicule and threatening physical violence, but now he goes personal. Personal. This is because they're running out of, he's running out of time. And well does the enemy know that his time is short. And here, whenever the wall was built but the gates weren't on, the enemy has tried many, many angles, but now he launches a personal attack. I suppose it's true to say that one of the most dangerous distractions for any of us in the work of God are the good opportunities that pull us away from God's best. I used to hear it said whenever we were in Bible college all those years ago, the good can become the enemy of the best. We can settle for lesser things. God is certainly more interested in his workmen than he is even in the work. I'll say this from, and I back it up from the story of Nehemiah, that Christian leaders are especially a target for Satan. I go as far as to say, you try to do anything in the work of God, you'll, you'll, you'll be a target. If Satan can bring down a leader, he can cause extensive damage to the flock. But whether a leader or not, the enemy still has the same tactics to hinder our walk with God. Satan's great deception, and there was a subtle appeal here, but his intent was to destroy. And he comes first of all, and in verse 2, St. Ballot, we're told, he goes on and he says, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do him mischief. Come, let us meet, meet together. Let us iron out our differences, he's saying here. Let us sort things out. We just want to foster mutual understanding. It all sounded so good, but Nehemiah rightly perceived that their intent was to ambush him if he had gone. You see, Satan still uses all sorts of innocent appeals to lure believers into his trap. Do you know he has many appeals? 
You think of it maybe an unsaved girl and some unsaved fellow comes into her life. Maybe even some unsaved fellow that would put a Christian to shame. And the devil, of course, will say, well, even though the Word of God tells us not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, surely this is a good man. This would be a man to spend my time with. I'm not going for some drunkard or somebody that's going to be bad to me. The enemy is very, very subtle. Many a pastor gets into the trap of compromising sound doctrine simply because of the cause of unity. Come, let us join together. We're all serving the same God. Over the years, I've had plenty of emails and and rights to different activities by different clergy and that. Come and uh, there's breakfast together and there's prayer uh, times together and all the rest of it. But you know, many a pastor has sacrificed true doctrine just to become popular. Satan is very persistent. He then sent messengers to Nehemiah, were told four times with the same invitation, Come, come. In verse 4, yet, yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Time, time, and time again. He wasn't being arrogant. He's saying, No, 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 I cannot do it. And there are some things that we can do, and there are some things that we cannot do. And there's some things that would go beyond conscience even. And I suppose Nehemiah could ask really here, what part of no don't you understand? I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. Just because you resist the devil once, doesn't think, don't think for a moment he'll leave you there. He will hit you again and again with the same temptations to wear you down. Look at the story of Delilah and Samson. I was reading about them there the other day. Now Samson eventually gave in to Delilah. He was able to nurse him in her lap. And he lost the power and the strength that he had. And so I said again, Nehemiah wasn't being arrogant. You're not being arrogant whenever you say no to someone. Whenever someone says to you, well, look here, I know you're a Christian. And mind you, in Christian circles today, alcohol and all has got very, very popular. And I can tell you one thing, dear friend, I'm totally against it. I was whenever I started in Cookstown, and I still am today. It has wrecked many a life. It has wrecked many a person's health. It has wrecked many a family. And sadly, in Christian circles today, alcohol is coming very much to the fore. It's a mocker. Solomon tells us strong drink is raging. You start partaking in it, we're not wise. We could say the same with gambling and many other things. This trip to the plain of Ono was one of a distraction. Yuma went and knew fine well that going down to Ono meant the work which stopped. So Nehemiah stood firm on his priorities that God had led in his heart and so four times he refuses. He knew the opportunity sounded good. But in the end, it would do him more harm than good. It would take him away from the work that God had called him to do. Did Satan give up? No, he didn't. We're told the next thing was there's these invitations to come to owner. Then he speaks slanderous rumors against Nehemiah. And so the spotlight turns to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Nehemiah here has been, is, is doing things that are extremely bad. Things that would need to be exposed. And so the spotlight goes to him. Now normally whenever these letters were told, these letters were written. In verse 5, 
Then sent Sinbalad his servant unto him in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And then there was a report. It has been reported among the heathen. Normally letters between officials were sealed letters and they were very, very private letters. Sinbalad knew that the servant who delivered the letter could read the letter and so could countless others along the route. You see, the letters were out to destroy him. The nice thing, I suppose, about a rumour is that you only have to launch it with one gossip and it will spread like a virus. Now, we're well used with, the vi- with what we're listening about COVID-19 and how the virus is spreading. That's the way rumour does. It will spread like a virus from person to person. It will grow more malicious as it travels. Rumour, do you know what Nehemiah was planning? This was it. He wants to get rid of the king. And rumours would have gone, no, but do you know why he's working so hard in that wall? It now makes sense. We're putting two and two together here, and this is what's going on. And so the rumour was going on and on and on. You know, no, no, no one that spreads rumours will ever ask what the goals are. They just drop the germs of the virus, of the rumours, and they let the virus spread. In my lectures to my students by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, which was the first book that I bought secondhand whenever I went into Bible college, Spurgeon has a chapter and it's entitled The Blind Eye and the Deaf Ear. He says in most cases pastors should let rumours die a natural death. He goes on and he talks about if you confront a gossip, you have to be prepared for the consequences uh, of what you'll get from it. Now, some of you will remember me tell a story, but I think it best illustrates to me as to how someone can start a rumour. I told this story different times in the church, but Uh, It illustrates to me as to how someone can gossip without getting into the nitty-gritties of things. And it was how one day I got a phone call to say a lady had died in the nursing home. And of course the lady that died was well in her 80s. I remember saying to the lady that phoned me, I said, but that's too bad. But mind you, she was a fair wee age, the lady that died. She was well into her late 80s. So that was okay. I was about to sit down the phone and then the lady comes again. But I just want to tell you something, Pastor. Seemingly she has died under suspicious circumstances. That was getting a wee bit more, more serious. Now, I've been in this nursing home where she died. I've been there. I have been over the years quite a bit. And here's somebody on the phone saying, a woman, this woman has died at 86, 87 years of age. But there's suspicious circumstances. So I thought I'd better nip this in the bud. And so I said, now, before we go any further, could you tell me where you got your information? And the response I got back was, another woman told me. Another woman told me. You see, usually with false rumours, the source is never declared. Do you notice in this story here, In verse 6 it tells us, wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen. They're not saying who did it, or who said it. It's reported. I've said before a numpteen times, you listen sometimes to people talking, and they'll use the expression, do you know what they tell me? Do you know what they say? Do you hear people talk like that? Do you ever stop and ask them, who are these people? You see, Spurgeon, he reckoned, was the people themselves. I remember a man saying to me one day, do you know what I, know what I hear? And started telling me things. And I looked at the man and I said, tell me this. Answer me a state question. Is the man that you're talking about, is it yourself? And he laughed and he says, it is. And there he's talking about, I was talking to a man, he's talking to himself. 
And so usually the source of rumours is never declared. I don't have an awful lot of time for those kind of things. There's the vague reference. Whenever you hear a gossip, you ask the source as to where it came from. Spurgeon said this here in that chapter to pastors. He said, your blameless life will be your best defense. He said, some lies especially have a peculiar smell about them. Isn't that so true? Have a peculiar smell about them. He says, they betray their rottenness to every honest nose. If you have been following Nehemiah's story, you will know that criticism was nothing new. He has refused to meet St. Ballot four times. The servant has come with the ladder. But the devil didn't give up. What, how did Nehemiah respond? Instead of chasing the rumours, he did what Spurgeon said. Let them die a natural death. Blameless life will be the best defence. He didn't stop the work. Neither did he slow down in the work. The point of the story is, don't get distracted by criticism. Someone may misunderstand you. They did with Nehemiah. How did he respond? He poured out his heart to God. He says to God, O oh God, in verse 9, Strengthen my hands. It's very easy to doubt ourselves, to doubt our abilities, to doubt our safety, and the risks sometimes that we have to take. But we must keep our eyes focused on the finishing line. Are you being distracted at present? Look to the source sometime. Get your eyes on the goal. May God bless his word to our hearts. We're going to sing in closing a lovely hymn that we haven't sung for some time. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. Just remaining seated as we sing.